You can turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. And we're going to continue with our series in Matthew 24 on the signs of the end times, or the times. Um, this is our eighth sermon in this series. Well, we can add Zechariah 6, the two sermons also in there, because it's also part of the end times. So, let's read together from Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to read from verse 15 to verse 22. You can follow me on the screen. And uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you. Matthew 24 verse 15 says, So when you see the, the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee, flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop, on the housetop not go down to take what is in the, his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to, the, to take his cloak. And alas, alas, what is Busegai? Alas. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can open your word. We thank you this morning that you are giving us the understanding. And Lord, we come humbly and we submit our lives before your throne this morning and just uh, come and submit and say, Lord, without you, without your Holy Spirit that can give us understanding, we, don't, we won't understand the Scripture. But Lord, speak to us through the Word and help us understand. Help us to adjust our lives where necessary so that we can live according to your plan and your will for us. I pray that you will be with us this morning as we, con we listen to your word in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So I want to quickly, just for those who haven't been with us and for the visitors, just show you the diagram that I kind of, as I prepare, it's developing. Um, I didn't come with a preset of ideas and frameworks to the text Although I have a, a, a framework of, of a humanetical model that I do follow, especially when it comes to eschatology, I decided to, to um, look at the text and let the text guide me in understanding and in interpreting what is going on in Matthew 24. So this is where we kind of ended last time. We looked at Matthew 24 from verse 4 to 14. That's what we did um, for seven sermons. We looked at false Christ, wars, famines, pestilence, earthquakes, persecution, falling away, false prophets, lawlessness, and the love that will grow cold of many. Now, I placed that under general signs, and I'm not going to explain the reasons, everything, why, because, well, maybe in short, because these signs are signs that has been happening for 2,000 years, and these signs do not indicate the end. Jesus said, verse 5, when you see these things, it's not the end yet. And also, verse 8, if I'm correct, he says, it's the beginning of sorrow. The word labor pain. Okay, we know when, when someone goes in labor, it starts, it starts and then as it goes on it increases and it intensifies and it becomes shorter the contractions so what i do i use that those verses to guide me in understanding this uh, specific chapter when i look at these signs we must look at them as not signs that indicate that the lord is coming so every time there's a war we don't jump on the wagon and say oh it's the end the lord is coming we have Hurt so many doom prophets. Am I right? 
When we see famine and false prophets, we don't jump and say, oh, it's the end. No, these are signs that from this, Jesus spoke these words, the disciples heard them that we've seen through all the centuries. That's why I place them under general signs because they do not indicate the end. And the reason also why I... Um, uh, yeah, general signs because we know it's still not the end. Now... I also mentioned quickly, if I can remind you, that this is not a timeline. Jesus didn't give us a timeline. He said, these are the, the, he's answering three questions of the disciples. When will the destruction of the temple be? When will be the, the sign of his, his coming and the end of the age? You remember those three questions? So Jesus is answering those questions. He did not try and give us a timeline so that we can figure out when Jesus will come. Okay, we must rather figure out what we must do when we see these signs. I think that's more important. And then verse 14, if I can quickly remind you the last time, it says the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout all the earth and then the end will come. So if you accept that verse as the end, then we have a problem with the next. If this chronologically and there's a timeline, we've got a problem because then the end comes, and then after the end, there's more signs, and also Jesus coming in uh, verse 27 to 31. So it's not a timeline. Don't look at this as a timeline. Okay, but Jesus is now focusing. He was focusing on this, and now he is focusing on specific signs to show us when you see these things, you will know it's the end. It is coming. So this is what where, where we are at verse 15, our text. So I want you to, to go, and I'm going to go through it a little bit cumbersome, but I, I want, you, want us to get to the meaning of this and what it also means for us as Christians. So verse 15, if you can quickly go back, and I highlighted some of the words because it's important. It starts with, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Now the verse starts with, so when. Some translations have it, therefore. Now if you get the word, therefore, so when, or you get those words, it connects it with the previous verses. So he's giving all these signs and they say, therefore, or so when, and the literal translation of the Greek words is, hotan un, meaning, whenever, then. Whenever then you see the abomination of desolation. So it ties it all with the preceding signs that Jesus gave us. And it does not indicate that verse 15 follows chronologically after verse 14. And I showed you why. Because then we, if the end is there, it won't work. Okay? We know that the end of the age and Jesus is coming will be at the same time. Uh, it will be when the gospel of the kingdom is, is proclaimed throughout all the earth, then the end will come. So Jesus is focusing on specific events that will take place just before the end. Now, okay, I'm not going to go there. It's a rabbit trail. Let's leave that. Um, let me go to again to the, our text, and I, I, I just highlighted some other words. And let's ask the question, but what is the abomination of desolation that Jesus is, is referring to? Now, abomination, and I just simply went into a dictionary. Abomination is something that is disgraceful. It is disgusting. Okay? And obviously, in this case, for God, to God, it's disgraceful. And desolation, is, the definition, it's a state of emptiness, desolate, or it can also refer to destruction. And so whatever it is that is disgraceful or um, disgusting to God will stand in the holy place and it will bring desolation. It will bring, it will lay to waste the holy place, if I can use that word. It will bring destruction to the holy place. Now, in Judaism... An abomination 
is usually an offensive form of idolatry. So Jesus here is describing a gross form of idolatry standing in the holy place. But he also said, which the prophet Joel was talking about. He said, spoken of by the, oh, not Joel, Daniel. Jylle luister nie, nee, nie van jylle help nie. That we spoken of by the, um, the prophet Daniel. Now, I see this as an invitation, Jesus inviting us to go to the book of Daniel, to go and study the book of Daniel so that we can learn and understand. Like he says, let the reader understand. So uh, it will help us to understand what he says. So let's go, and I'm going to refer to Daniel so that we can understand what this means. Now, there are three specific references that we find in Daniel about the abomination of desolation. Um, Daniel 9 verse 27. Now, I wish I could go into all the detail, but I'm just going to give you what we need to understand our text. Verse 27 says, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half a week of the week. He shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So he makes a, a covenant with, uh, he, he, the, he refers to the Antichrist. So I can actually prove that, but uh, it's going to take a lot of our time. So just accept by faith what I say this morning. Is that fine? So the Antichrist will make a covenant with many, referring to the Israelites, for one week. And in Hebrew terms, the, uh, the, the week refers to seven years. They didn't have an equivalent uh, term to, to use, so they talked about weeks. Now, that would be seven years, one week. And note that halfway through this week, he will put an end to sacrifice and to offering. So where, where, where did the Jews sacrifice? In the temple. They sacrificed and, and brought offerings in the temple. So the holy place that Jesus is referring to is not Jerusalem. He's talking about the temple. Okay? And if you continue, it says, And on the wing of abominations shall come one who makes desolate Desolate, um, uh, desolation, ach, desolate, shall come who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So the abomination of desolation, and here we have the first clue of the abomination of desolation, and that is the Antichrist will bring an end to to sa sacrifice an offering. It's important that we take that note. That's the first clue. He will do something disgraceful that will make the temple desolate. That's, um, that's what he will do. On the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. So let's go to Daniel chapter 11, 31. It says, forces from within shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering. Can you see that? Same idea. Take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Okay, so the abomination is something that will be set up in the temple, in the holy place and it will make desolate it will bring destruction okay some believe that and you can go and read the history that this might be referring to a syrian ruler his name antiochus epiphanes who reigned during 175 to 164 bc uh, uh, almost 400 years after prophet daniel spoke this 
this happened. Now Antiochus, you can go and read, it's very interesting. He went, he went into the temple, he stopped the sacrifices, and he offered in the temple an unclean animal. Who wants to guess what he offered? A pig on the altar. So he kind of made a disgraceful thing of the temple and the altar. And of course, for the Jews, this was unacceptable. Now, there, there are books written named the Maccabees that kind of gives us a lot of history on this that also tells us that he set up a Greek god idol in the temple. Now, it might be that this was a fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. I would a little bit disagree because there's too many details that are missing there. But Jesus was clearly referring when he said that when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, he was referring to the future. When you see this future. So the first clue that we have is that the sacrifice and offerings will end. Just, like, uh, just a side note, just want to st- tell you. When, when they sacrifice and make offerings in the temple, in the tribulation period, it's not a good thing. Why? Because Jesus was the last and ultimate sacrifice. No other sacrifices can be make, made. But they, the Jews, will, um, will bring sacrifice and offering in the temple. They, they will, in the, obviously, in the tribulation period. The second clue is that the abomination will be set up in the temple. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Now, the, the next clue we find is in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifices is taken away, and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,000 290 days until the end. When the, <coughs> sorry, when the sign is set up, it says the end may be determined. There will be almost three and one half years to go. Now, a lunar cycle, a calendar, had only 360 days. That's the Jewish calendar. And if you make the sum, it actually comes to 1,260 and not 90 for three and a, and a half years. But somewhere there's a 30-day gap or overlap that I'm not sure with, and I'm, I'm actually confessing that I don't really know, and I'll have to go and look about that 30 days. But if you go to Revelation, it's 1,260 days for three and a half years. So this is the third clue that we find in the text that this will continue after the sacrifices end and the the abomination set up in the temple, there will be three and a half years and then the end. Are you following me? Okay, does it make sense? Okay, so Jesus says when you... When you see this happening, when you see this sign, the end is near. It indicates that the end is near, that which uh, um, Daniel has spoken of. Now, some do believe, and I just mentioned this, that it was already fulfilled in 70 AD when the Romans under the emperor of the... um, Titus, the Roman soldier, came to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. But, but remember, I mentioned this before, it, it's, it's called a preterist view. That is when everything happened in the past. Do you remember that, that sermon, those of you? Are you listening? That's the preterist view. And they do have reasons why they say this, but I, I don't think, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details why I believe the scripture doesn't support that view But I'll only mention this, that three and a half years after Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed, Jesus did not come and the end did not come. 
Okay, so it doesn't make sense. Otherwise, you have to kind of allegorize or see it symbolically or do, ignore the scripture. I don't know how they do it. But anyways, I do believe that Jesus is still refer, referring to a future event and it, uh, it is closely related to the future fulfillment of his second coming as, um, when he comes to, to set up his kingdom. Now let's go to the gospel of Mark that will give us more clues about the abomination of desolation mark chapter 13 verse 14 the same scripture if you compare that with matthew 24 jesus is saying this he says but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be let the reader understand let those who are in judea flee to the mountains so just to show you i highlight it again it says where standing where he ought not to be now the greek word for standing is the word hestekota and in greek we the the words have articles we call it article in in, in english so that the form the form of the word veers which will tell us what is the what it is referring to and in this case it's in the masculine form the masculine article so the abomination of death the abomination is not a something but it is a someone it is a person where he is not he is not supposed to be he where he ought not to be if we go to paul I'm giving you a lot of, I'm just jumping. There's no way I can put this in one sermon to explain every single text in, 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 the, in, in the chapters and book. But Paul gives us also information. He says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 and 4, he says, Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of of destruction he's referring to the end that day will not come the end will not come before the law man of lawlessness the man of destruction is revealed so just from my understanding we as christians are not looking forward to an antichrist to be revealed we are looking forward to Jesus who's going to come and receive us unto himself. That's the imminent return of Jesus. That's why I believe in the rapture. Now, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, who is he? He's the Antichrist. He's the desolator. Then verse 4 says, Who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Can I say it's disgraceful when someone proclaims himself to be God, makes himself an idol. He sits in the temple of God, he is the abomination himself that brings disgrace to the holy place. Now here, just to note that the temple that Paul is referring to here is not the church. For the church does not have a holy place. This is just a building. Amen? We are the temple of God. Now, if I interpret that I'm the temple of God, then I've got a issue. How do you interpret the, the abomination standing in this temple filled with the Holy Spirit? Doesn't make sense. So this must refer to a Jewish temple. But wait a minute, wasn't the Jewish temple destroyed? 70 A.D.? There's no temple. And it follows that the temple, logically, if I understand, the temple must be rebuilt. 
I believe if God can cause a nation to be reborn, Israel in May 1948 against all odds, the temple is not a problem. Well, Nehemiah built a temple in 50 days. Oh, well, the walls, sorry, the walls. But I believe, and should we accept this by faith? Of course, we have to, but God is faithful and His Word is true. Revelation 11, let me go to Revelation. And the more I study this, the more I want to study this. And you know what? Revelation is the only book in the Bible that actually promises that if you read it, you will be blessed. Did you know that? But pastor, that's so difficult, I can't read it. Because you don't know your Bible. Revelation 11 verse 1 says, Then I was given a measuring rot like a stuff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. Listen, Revelation is still future, and the temple must be measured. The altar must be measured. People will worship there. It's a place. You can go there. And verse 2 then says, But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. How, how, how long is that? Three and a half years. The Bible is in harmony. So it is clear from this text that there will be a temple. The temple will be trampled for 42 months. 42 months, three and a half years. Exactly the time period described by the prophet Daniel. Now, uh, let me summarize. Let me kind of put this all together for us to understand. So if we put this together, first we see the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel. For one week, that is seven years, and he will break this covenant halfway, that's three and a half years, where he will end sacrifice, he will end offering, he will set up the abomination of desolation in the temple, which himself will sit in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God, and this will indicate, be an indication to us that there's only three and a half years left. And then Jesus will come. Does that make sense? So let's go to our di diagram and let's put something extra. I put there the abomination of desolation. That's a sign, specific sign. And three and a half years. Then, So obviously this will happen somewhere, if you want to put a timeline here, before the gospel has been preached to all the nations. Somewhere there. So it is unlikely that the Antichrist will personally stand in the holy place for three and a half years. Okay, it's unlikely. And that is what, why we see in Revelation 13, you can go and read it, verse 11, from verse 11, that there will be a false prophet, the second beast, the false prophet that will create an image and the, um, uh, uh, an image of the beast. Now, I'm not going to go into all the detail. We have the Antichrist. I believe he will be more of a political leader and more involved with government and those things. But the false prophet will be like the Pope of the false church. And he will create an image and, uh, of the beast and will command the world to worship it. And this image will also remain in the holy place. So the abomination of desolation standing in the, holy, in the holy place, the temple, can refer to both the person, the Antichrist, and the image of the Antichrist, an idol. If I'm correct, I'm trying to remember that he gives that image some spirit to talk 
So he can speak. I once read someone's interpretation. I was laughing. He said it's the TV. <laughs> the TV is set up in your house and it talks. <laughs> it's the image of the beast. That was when TVs just came out. So don't worry, it's not the TV. But you shouldn't watch TV so much, eh? <laughs> okay. Because there might be a devil in there talking to you. <laughs> okay, so during the last three and a half years, the Antichrist will pursue and persecute the Jews. And that is why Jesus tells them in the next five verses from verse 16 to verse 20 to run, to get out of there, to flee to the mountains. Let's quickly look at verse 16. It says, let, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Now verse 15 ended with, Let the reader understand. And the implication of this command is that the reader can understand the, this prophecy. And the implication also is that those who, Whoever sees this happening, this event taking place, um, can, can be anyone. And Jesus is not necessarily saying this to his disciples, but the, to those who see this happening, um, that they should flee. And the point is that in whatever century this warning is read, must understood so that they can know when it happens that they must get out of there. Now, favorite John MacArthur, I read him also a lot. He agrees with us. He says the exhortation that the reader understand reinforces the fact that Jesus was not giving the warnings in the olive discourse the to the disciples themselves. Some would, but preterists would say that. Preterists would say this is just for the disciples. But he says it's not for them or to their generation, but to the believers in the end time who will read those truths in Scripture and thereby be enabled to understand the trials they are enduring. Now the only problem I have, do have with this statement is the fact that it talks about believers in general in the end time when in fact this only refers to those who live in Judea and they are Jews that will flee when this comes. However, Vernon McGee, and I refer a lot to him, also says, saying correctly that those people living in Israel at the time that sees the abomination of desolation, and they must understand they, it's time to go. So let's read it again. Verse 16 says, Then let the, those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop and only houses in, you know, the houses in Jerusalem, they've got flat tops. Okay, um, they uh, should not go down to take what is in the house. Verse 18, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. So this is a warning for the Jews in Judea to flee to the mountains when they see this happening. This is an actual event that's going to take place. They have to get out of there as fast as they can. Why? Because there's only three year and a half years left. And these last three and a half years of tribulation is going to be something that the world has never seen yet. The Antichrist who, who made a covenant with Israel will break his covenant with them and he will change from being the protector of Jew, the, uh, Israel to being the persecutor of Israel. And they have to get away as fast as they can. The women that are pregnant, obviously they will have more difficulty, greater hardship, will be at risk. It will not be easy for them. The remnant Jews must pray that this does not happen in the winter. Why? Because in the winter is rainy season. And with the rain, it will be a difficult and hazardous um, to travel in Judea, the Judean hills when it rains. On the Sabbath. Why? Because on the Sabbath, it imposes traveling restrictions and transportation would be limited. Now listen to, and I want to go back to Revelation 12, just to 
color this a little bit in so that we understand. It says, verse 12 is 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is be, to be nourished for 1,260 days. How long is that? Three and a half years. Who do you think is the woman? Israel. And it's interesting, it says she's going to have a baby. And the baby will be taken up in heaven. Now some believe that's the church, I don't believe so. Because the baby, I do believe, uh, is the 144,000 that will be taken away. Okay, that's the... the fifth or sixth rapture that I can think of. Anyways, there are seven raptures in the Bible, by, by the way. So the woman here refers to Israel and she flees to the wilderness. She must flee without consideration for any provisions. Why? Because God will nourish her. God has made a place, prepared a place to look after her and care for her for the, for the last three and a half years. And then verse 12 and to verse 14 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon, that is Satan, saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So the dragon, the devil himself, will pursue the woman. He will go after her. His wrath will be against them, the Jewish nation. And then the next verse says, But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. So God will give her wings. Not literally, obviously. But He will carry her and protect her and take her to the place where what He has prepared. Now, if you go to Revelation 12, 12 the first few verses, I remember a year ago there was a thing going on on Facebook and People saying it's the end of the world because of the stars, who they, they align, the women with the... Remember that? And I was looking at it and said, people, what? God never told us to look, look through the lenses of astrology to understand the Bible. We never do that. And I actually told one of the, the people I knew a long time ago that he is completely wrong and he, he was just condemning me. Ah, yeah, you should warn the people it's the end of the world. Da, 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 da. But if it wasn't, we're still here. <laughs> They're interpreting the Bible wrong. This is talking about Israel who is going to flee from the mountains, flee, get away, and the devil will come after her, but God will give her wings and he will take care of her, nourish her, and it, it says a time and times and half a time. It means one times two and half a times a half. How much is that? Three and a half. So may, maybe God will provide, I'm just guessing, the f like manna in the wilderness as He provided for them, for Moses. Maybe he will also provide water through the rock. We, we don't know. I'm just guessing. But the truth remains this, that God will save and protect her and provide for her during this final tribulation time before he comes. Why? Matthew 24, verse 21. For then will be there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. So 70 AD, no, it's not referring to that. Because World War II, World War I, a lot more Jews killed. 
in World War II than in 70 AD. So this time will, it says, um, verse 22, And if those days have not been cut short, no human being would be saved. That's a scary thought. Just think about it. All the countries in our world that has nuclear power. You know, in the 1940s, I think America was the first country. I don't know all the dates. And then it was India, and then Pakistan. And then all the others came on board. Russia. And I think North Korea does have. I don't know, I'm just guessing. So we can go on and on. Just think about it. We are the most endangered species species on this world we have the power to wipe out everything existing living because we have nuclear power in the world but god will not allow this if those days had not been cut short no human being would be saved but for the sake of the elect those days will be cut short this time will be so bad that in those days, it doesn't mean that the three and a half years will be cut shorter because I believe God's time is fixed. God's time is pre predetermined, but it is going to be so bad that if this will continue, we will, we will, nobody will live. No human being will survive. But those days will be cut short to only three and a half years. Thank the Lord. Because it is for the sake of the elect. And here it refers to the Jews, not the church. Just to remind you, it's for the sake that it should, for their sake. So let's put the puzzle, pieces of the puzzle together. When the Jews living in Judea, see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, they must run. They must get out of there. There's no time to collect anything. They won't need anything because God will provide. Satan will pursue them, but God will carry her on his wings to safety. And he will nurture them and care for them. Now in close, I want to say this. There's never been a time in history that describes what Jesus here in Matthew 24, from verse 15 onwards, describes. There's never been a time in history. It's a time of judgment. Remember Zechariah 6. Against the world, against those who hate God and hate Christ. And from Revelation 6 to verse, uh, chapter 6 to 16, we read about judgments of God. The seal judgments. The trumpet judgments. The bowl judgments. The angels, the four living creatures that will throw the wrath of God onto this world. And on third, we read in Revelation that one third of the people of this planet will die. And then another third of those who are left will die. Now why, why tribulation? Why all these judgments? Because in part, to the, in part, it's to harvest the crop that has been sown. Galatians 6 verse 7 and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows that he will, all, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Human beings will reap what they sowed. Satan will reap what he sowed. Nations will reap what they sowed. Three groups of people, human beings collectively, demonic beings collectively, sovereign nations, and the tribulation period is going to prove once and for all that Satan is a liar and he never told the truth. 
Tribulation period is going to prove to those who claim you can have life, love, peace, harmony without God and without Christ. It's going to prove to them that they are deluded. And in short, Satan is going to have a brief victory, but God will have the ultimate, final victory. The tribulation period is going to prepare a multitude for heaven. But it is also going to prepare even more people for judgment. The tribulation period will take place to purge the Gentiles, but also to purge Israel and to prepare the earth for the time of the coming of the King Jesus Christ who will come and literally sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. That's what the tribulation period is doing, will do. And although the earth will experience judgment, I'm so grateful that grace precedes judgment the grace of god precedes judgment we are living today in the time of grace we have the opportunity now to turn from our sins we have the opportunity now to turn to christ we have the opportunity now to cry out to him lord save me We have that opportunity now to put our trust in Him and be saved before it is too late. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You that Your grace is enough. We thank You, Lord, that we can come to You and there's nothing that we can bring It's nothing that we can offer that is good enough. But Lord, you have given everything. You've given your Son to die on the cross so that we can be reconciled to you. Lord, this morning, we just look at our own lives and and I pray for for every one of us. If anyone doesn't have any assurance that they are saved, any one of us has not come to that place where we placed our trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that they will grab this opportunity with everything this morning. That they will humble themselves under the mighty God, uh, hand of God, that they will submit their lives to you. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful and you will... You are faithful and just. Lord, you will forgive. You like the Father with open arms to receive us. May we run to you this morning. May we come to you, your throne of grace. I ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Holy Spirit, be the the after preacher of this sermon. And work in all of our lives. Open our eyes, open our understanding, Lord, so that we will know, that we will read and we will understand. It's my prayer in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.